Okay, so now let's take a look at how we can compute the voltage rise using the k-factor approach. And as you recall, the k-factor had two different parts to it. There was a, a real part to it and there was a reactive part to it. I should say it's due to resistance and due to reactance. It was, it's, it's a function of the power factor angle. And so this was in units of percent voltage drop per kVA mile. Now, if I had a load on this line segment and if it was capacitive in nature, then basically what this would look like from the sake of voltage drop calculations would just be a load that had a power factor angle of minus 90 degrees. And so if I just substitute in for theta equal to minus 90 degrees, what happens as far as this equation right here? Well, cosine of minus 90 degrees, this is simply going to be zero. The sine theta with theta equal minus 90 degrees, this is going to go to minus one. And so when I do my voltage change, then this is going to be the line length times minus the line reactance divided by the voltage squared. This is, remember this is a line to neutral value, times 10 to the fifth divided by three times whatever this capacitor value would be in terms of the, in terms of the K bar. And so the interpretation is if I have a percent voltage drop term that's negative, instead of getting a voltage drop, now what I'm gonna get is a voltage boost. And so basically it's the interaction, it's the interaction between the line reactance in the capacitance, which is gonna give us this, this voltage boost effect. And, and again, what you have to watch out for is you gotta watch out for overcompensating because you can actually make this as high as you want to, but then you have all these different undesirable effects when you do so. So if you're looking at the impact on profile on a, on a distribution feeder at the top, let's suppose we put our capacitor toward the end of the circuit. If I have a situation without the capacitance, what I get is I get this lower type of curve here where the voltage is dropping, 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 dropping until we get to the end of the feeder. And perhaps it drops below the minimum acceptable threshold that we want to use for planning purposes. Well, how do I fix this? Well, what I would do is I would put a capacitor in at this point. And what this does, it has the impact of changing the slope on this curve. In other words, we get a voltage rise up to where that capacitor is actually at. And it changes the slope of the curve. We're, we're basically kind of modifying the profile. Once we get past the capacitor, then we have the normal voltage drop that we've kind of had before. But basically what this does is it shifts up this curve. Now, if I put too large a capacitor in here, and if I get too much boost, it could actually push this capacitor up, this, I should say, the voltage up uh, above our upper limit, right? So you have to make sure that we don't overcompensate. But anyway, what we're going to be doing later on, like in the project in part two, is we're going to be shaping this voltage profile curve. And one way we can do that is through the use of capacitors. Now, the issue we run into with capacitor banks, since they have discrete sizes, is what's going to happen when I have a variation in load. We, we talked about this before in the load characteristics lecture, that load changes with time. It changes during the course of a day. It changes with season of the year. And so I got two different basic shapes. I have what we call the summer type shape, which peaks in late afternoon. I have a winter type shape which usually peaks in the morning, but a lot of times have a, has a second peak characteristic, which occurs later in the day when people come home and turn their heating back on again, or add cooking load to this. And so the problem we run into is if this load changes during the day, well, how do we come up with a capacitor size? Because what you need to do for, uh, and these problems I've worked up this to a certain point, is you need to have a value for load and then you figure out the value of capacitance, which minimizes like say like reactive power flow at the top of the feeder. But if load's changing all the time, well, what do you use for capacitors? And this is kind of what we want to deal with in, in this particular segment of the lecture.
So let's look at a base case. And let's suppose in the base case, I've got a summer profile. And this top curve is my real power consumption which changes with time. And this curve below that in green is my reactive power. And I'm assuming in this case, they have a constant power load. And so basically my load K bar kind of is kind of linked to my load kilowatt as a function of time. If you had a sample circuit, the sample circuit I showed you before, and if you were gonna go and you were gonna look at the voltage at the load as a function of time, you get this curve in blue, where at light loading conditions, the voltage would actually appear to come up. But then as the load would increase, then the load drops, 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 where it's at minimum value during the load peak. Losses has an inverse characteristic so when we're operating under the light loading conditions, our, our losses are low, but then if we start to approach peak, then the losses start to become higher, higher, higher until they're a maximum peak. And given that the losses are related to the current squared, it's a, it's a quadratic type of relationship. So anyway, the reality is if you had a circuit that basically, if you didn't do anything, you would get a varying voltage across the load and then the losses would also vary with time as well. So how are we going to fix something like this? Well, what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to have switch capacitors. And the reality would be that we could have all switch capacitors or we can have a combination of fixed and switch capacitors. So you could see that in the morning we do have a certain amount of capacitive load, right? Um, what we could do to compensate for that is we could just simply put a fixed capacitor in there, a 600K bar. And what that's gonna do is gonna push or squash this reactive power profile at the top of the substation down. It pushes it towards zero, if you wanna think about it that way. It pushes it toward this zero axis. Then when the load picks up to a certain point and the reactive power is high, what we would do is we would switch in the, the second capacitor. And so if, if that's gonna be the case, then if we switch in say like a 600 K bar capacitor, then what we have is we have a varying reactive power compensation in this case. And what that does is again, tends to squash the reactive power down to the zero axis. So essentially what we're trying to do is we're trying to compress the reactive power that we see at the top of the feeder or at the substation through the control of the capacitor banks on the circuit. Now, if you want to more fine tune this, you could fine tune this. And so instead of having 600 K bar um, increments, I could have 300 K bar increments and I can get more fine tuned control but you run into diminishing returns with this because each capacitor switch capacitor, say it costs you $10,000 to get into the field. Well, you can't get a return on your investment because you don't get that much better benefit through having a lot of switch banks as opposed to just like say like a few. Um, and so this is very, very typical utilities is they'll have some combination of fixed and um, switch capacitance, or maybe let's just have all switch capacitors, and they'll use this for basically tracking the reactive load as a function of time. You'll see in here that if I switch the capacitors on, if you look at the voltage curve, that the voltage curve gets a little bit more levelized now. It still looks like it's varying because that's just because of the scale. But we kind of flatten out the voltage profile, and then what this also does too is it kind of in, improves our overall loss situation a little bit where we're not burning up so much energy in terms of line losses in this case. Um, but we would need to have a control in order to do this. We need to have some mechanism for turning this switch capacitor bank on and off then. So when you have a control out in the field, uh, this is just gonna be like a small little electronic box and at a minimum, we would generally want to monitor voltage. And you could actually do this through the power transformer that's providing 120 volt power to the capacitor bank uh, control. 
And then you could also take a current measurement. You can add a current measurement to this as well. You can maybe also add temperature, but current measurements tend to be kind of expensive. If you put little current transducers up on primary voltage, that gets a little bit pricey. So a lot of utilities don't like doing that. They'll, they'll take voltage measurement, maybe temperature, but getting current adds a lot to the cost of putting that in the field. But what we can do if we had these possible measurements, then we could switch on the voltage, we could switch on time, we could switch on temperature, we can switch on current level, or we could even switch on reactive power level. We could have all these feedback control setups in order to switch on these measured values. And this table shows kind of like the summarizes the strategy and the pros and cons of each. And so if you had a load that was very predictable, let's suppose you had a factory there and it had the same load profile every day, a time clock would just be fine. When the load picked up, you turn the capacitor on. When the load would drop off, you take the capacitor out. And if a factory had a fixed schedule, you just put a time clock in there. So, you know, some utilities just use time clocks. It turns out that if air conditioning is your main load, then your air conditioning load becomes highest when the temperature goes up. So you could use temperature as a feedback where if the temperature is high, you're assuming you're gonna need more capacitors to compensate the air conditioning load. Voltage is probably one of the more common ones. If the voltage gets low, you switch capacitor in and boost the voltage up. Voltage gets too high, switch capacitor out, voltage drops back down. So voltage is very common. You, if you have the current sensor, you could switch on bars or you can switch on power factor or current. Um, but again, you have to have the additional cost of the current transducer. And there's also like more sophisticated types of controls. Um, some of these companies have these auto adaptive controls, which will kind of tune these uh, set points based on, you know, something like artificial intelligence or machine learning. Um, then you also would have centralized control where you could just simply have a SCADA system monitor all this. The SCADA system takes the measurement and makes the decision and sends the switching command back to the capacitor bank control. Uh, there's a lot of different ways you could, you could do this. Now, we, we talked about doing this with, with um, line voltage regulators and what's basically going to be the difference. Well. The line voltage regulator has more resolution in terms of the taps. So we've already seen that we get kind of like a 5 eighths percent resolution with each tap. So if he really wanted to fine tune the voltage control, a line regulator would be the way to go. The line regulator, if it's placed upstream of a load where it's separated by line resistance, you can also implement a, a load uh, line drop compensation or LDC. Okay, so you can actually get better resolution of the voltage with using a line regulator, but the problem is, is the cost. I mean, this is going to cost a lot more, um, you know, maybe 10 times more than just putting capacitor banks out there. And so with the line regulator, you, you get more resolution, more detailed control over the voltage than you can with the capacitor, but it's, it's much, much more expensive. Um, so anyway, just to compare these, switch capacitor banks as an investment, uh, a lot less expensive, right? And this, these are kind of low numbers right here for three phase regulators. I mean, if you had them larger in size, they'd be a lot more expensive than this. These are probably more when you get closer to the load. Um, but the problem with having the switch capacitor banks is you have to switch these in large increments. So you're typically switching in you know, maybe 1200 K bar or 1800 K bar, 2100 K bar, usually switching large amounts of K bar. So the voltage goes way up or way down. Where line regulators, you can make fine tune adjustments. And then also too, with the voltage regulators, you actually have the additional functionality since you have the current measurements of doing what's called line drop compensation. So if you needed the more exact control, you'd, you'd have to go with the line voltage regulator. But if you just wanted to get an overall boost in the voltage, um, capacitors would be the way to go. This just shows what some of these controllers look like. 
probably at the low end. Um, these are maybe thousand dollar boxes. And then if you get more and more control functionality, they're gonna cost more. But these aren't really very expensive controls. Um, they're not that sophisticated, really. All If you're all you're doing is controlling on voltage, it doesn't really take a lot of logic to do that. But basically, uh, um, most of the vendors would have a dedicated capacitor control they would actually sell. Uh, you can see in this case, you could put a radio in here, uh, put a radio inside the case, and you can actually communicate to a device that's in a remote location then. And then this just shows all the different control features that's available in most of the common capacitor controls. And I don't think I need to go through this here, but if this is something you're interested in, generally you can get the manual for these devices and you can see what all they can do. So as far as switching strategy, what you're gonna switch on, every utility has something different. And this is all based on the history of the utility and how they did their planning and what their strategy was for putting capacitors out in the field. Uh, a lot of utilities, what they'll do is that they have a minimum amount of reactive load on a circuit is they may compensate that with a fixed capacitor. And then if they have the K bar increase, and let's suppose this is increasing it at known time, maybe this is gonna be time switched. Um, and then once you get up near your peak, then maybe this is where they're going to put in like a voltage switch capacitors in order to make that adjustment. You have some utilities that don't even want to mess with fixed capacitors, worrying about what you can do with the fixed capacitor versus a switch, and they just put in all switch capacitors. So each utility has their own philosophy on this, and they, they do slightly different things. The trend now is to move away from just using local controllers. The local controllers are you have to set those up using a power flow program. You have to go through a design on it to come up with the thresholds. And it's kind of hard to optimize those. And so the trend now is to move to what we would call integrated volt bar control. We actually coordinate these capacitor controllers with the line voltage regulator controls. And so you basically have those controllers out in the field interface to some type of a control box, a master logic box. And then you use a model of the circuit and you would kind of optimize um, the set points. And we'll talk about that in the future lecture about what's kind of behind volt bar control. So I'm going to go ahead and stop this lecture segment here. And when we pick up again, we're just going to go through a few worked examples. <laughs>